The Pod Barber. Coming up on today's show... Well, we got ambushed, really. They knew exactly what they were doing. Um, so we, there, was, there was two compounds, and we just started taking big fire from everywhere. And it was pretty intense. So Ben had a lasm, yeah? So he wanted to fire it, because once you fired it, you got rid of it. One of the lads, I didn't hear, said, no, you can't. Because to fire the lads, you can't fire it from the prone. When you're up on the rooftop getting an income in, you're prone, you're laying down, you know? But he wanted to get up, so he got up onto his knee to fire it. And as soon as he did, he got shot straight through the neck. Got on the net to the higher up, saying, look, one of the lads has been shot, you got to come, you know? They wouldn't come and land because it was hot because we were taking so much fire. They've got a rule that if you're taking fire, you're in a red zone. They won't come and land because they, they say an aircraft's worth more than a, than, a, than a life, unfortunately. It's just the way it is. We had to carry his body about 500 metres under fire so he could get airlifted out. But he died already. But war don't stop, you know. You're listening to The Pop Barber. I'm champion in the chat, proving conversation is the cure to better mental health and well-being. Meet my guests from all walks of life, showing vulnerability and sharing wisdom. Sit in on my chats and be part of reality entertainment. Join the Pod Barber tribe, subscribe, share and like people. Feel the sonic positivity we're pumping right at you. You, my friends, are not alone. Who's next, please? Well, I'll tell you who. Today we join forces with former Royal Marine Commando Mark Lovell. Serving with 4-2 Commando, Mark was deployed with his company to the war in Afghanistan. A very aggressive period and part of Operation Herrick 9, in which the Commando unit took heavy casualties, soldiers returning with life-changing injuries and many heroes lost. After his days as a royal, he joined the gold rush into anti-piracy, working in small teams chasing Somali pirates around Africa and the Indian Ocean. As the rush ended, he turned to the world of barbering, reinventing himself once again. Eventually, his war caught up with him. Inadequate emotional control led to alcohol and substance abuse and a period of poor mental health followed. Perhaps the alpha male-driven masculinity and the man-up approach of life had not trained the skills and importance of opening up and self-awareness that's required in the face of trauma. But Mark had accrued many life skills, so he used that ability to change and adapt, shifting his focus and mindset. Now we celebrate him hearing his details from his story as he hopes to inspire self-belief and success in others our military forces deserve to be heard. So stop scrolling, start listening to the one with Mark Lovell. Welcome to the show, man. Hi. Well, that was uh, impressive. <laughs> well, really impressive, actually. It was better than I can expect from an intro, really. It had everything bang on the money, really, I think, with that. You know, you're one of our heroes, man, and we, we, you know, we're here to celebrate that, listen to the stories of Afghan. But before we get into those bits, give me some context of the kind of kid you were at school. I didn't really enjoy school. I think I was, uh, my mind was always rushing really fast. I couldn't sit and concentrate too much. I wasn't that naughty, but I certainly wasn't intelligent. So I struggled a little bit. Um, I just really liked the PE side of things more than the sitting down. I wanted to get out and do things. Um, so it wasn't for me so much school life. Back in the day, probably like a lot of guys that thought, you know, where do I fit in? Maybe that energy. Why don't I join? The Royal yeah. Marines, you know. Well, I, did, I didn't I... think about it. The Marines w- weren't on my even in my mindset at all, to be honest, as a kid. I, again, like I say, I'm, I was probably the opposite. I was quite mothered, so I was quite a scared, skinny lad. I wasn't thinking about the Royal Marines, certainly at school age, you know. I worked at the men's room at school, sweeping the floor. Which is a barber shop. Yeah, the, the barber shop, which is Mr. Barber's now. So I was sweeping the floor and stuff. And I was actually going to go into that because I didn't want to stay on in education. So I started to look at training up and doing a little bit. But again, I was very active and I thought there's more I needed to do. But again, I still didn't know what. And I actually went to the cinema and before the film started, it was a Royal Marine advert. And back then the whole marketing campaign was 99.99% need not apply. There's a kid going under the underwater tunnel and he's caught on something. Basically sort of how tough it all was. So I thought, yeah, I, I want to challenge myself. That looks exciting. I didn't have a clue about the Marines. I didn't have a clue about the military, but I just wanted the challenge of the commando course and test. And I started looking it up really. I guess I was only still... 16, 17, and I applied to go. What a great marketing tool. That was bang on the that's money. Proper, that's proper, that's yeah. proper marketing, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they're, they're more, I think they had to change that after a while because they thought it was too aggressive and too... But that's what I believe you, you want. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it was perfect for me. The family doesn't... Do you have a lineage of no, forces got, representation? No, no, definitely not. No immediate family were military, nothing to do with the military, really. Were, were they supportive of this? So I've got one side of my family, my mum's side, they're very, very, very family-orientated, loving. And then I've got my dad, who's an alcoholic, 
been in prison, moving around, multiple marriages. The other end of the spectrum, you'd never put them together, you know. So I've had two sides of the spectrum, which is why my personality is pulled in different directions at times, you know. But nothing to do with military or my mum would support me for anything, you know. She's a real loving person. My dad, yeah, is the same. Tell us a bit about that application process then. What goes on? First of all, you have an initial sort of interview and you speak to them. And then the first thing you actually have to do, I think it's called psychometric testing, recruitment test, basically it's English, math, science. It's the same test as the Navy, so it's not that easy, but you need the lowest mark because the Marines is more physical. Um, so no one genuinely fails it. Yeah. Well, I actually failed it. Um, so, yeah, they pulled me in the office and afterwards and said, look, really, you can't go on because you didn't get high enough mark on it. And so, and like I say, sort of 16 at the time, or maybe just 17. And he said, well, you've got two options. You can either retake the test again in a year and come back in another year. Or if you go into education, um, you can retake the test in six months. So I said, oh, perfect. I'll do that. I'll go and do public services at Berry College mm-hmm. and I'll take the test again. Yeah. But it didn't finish it. So he said, well, I'll tell you what, do the um, the fitness test because that lasts a year. So that's, at least that's another thing ticked off. So it'd be quicker when you, when you do it. So I said, OK, great. So I signed up straight away to do the fitness test. And my granddad took me to the test centre and then you had to do two mile and a half runs on the treadmill. So the guy sets it up and he says, right, do this speed. And this is the first speed. It's just like a warm up. So I've done that. And then he sets it obviously faster. And he says, right, if you can stay on the treadmill and complete it, then you'll complete the test. So he set it up and walked off. And I was like, Phew. I started increasing the speed. And people started looking over and I was increasing the speed again and again. I was like, and then I just maxed out the treadmill and I just smashed it. And, people, <laughs> and, I, and I love the attention because I don't ever get attention from sort of intelligence. People started looking over and paying attention to me. And I, mm. and I think I got a buzz off that, you know, and, and I just smashed it. And at the end, my granddad was clapping and that. So anyway, I went to college and this true story. Day two of the college, I got a call. They rang me up and they said, Mark, we got your fitness test um, results in. And we spoke to the Marines and they're going to waiver the, the RT test score. He said, don't worry about it. Go down to the PRMC, Potential War Marines course, three-day course. If you get on down there, they'll they'll have you in. So, yeah, that's what I did. And uh, went down for three days and smashed the fitness stuff down there. And then I was allowed to start training. Yeah, the training. Tell us how long the commando course is and what the training was like. So that was extremely tough for me. Physically, I love fitness, so I didn't actually find that hard. Mm. But I enjoyed your it. Body you know? Yeah, I enjoyed up. that. Yeah, I was physically yeah. robust and I enjoyed the fitness side of things. But I was, again, like we've spoke about, that complete other end of the spectrum to a Royal Marine when I started training. Um, I think most people who go in the services, like, like we spoke about, you have maybe some family that have been in. Mm-hmm. You might have went to the cadets. You've got some form of military bearing. I knew nothing. I didn't know what weapons were called or anything. So when you go in, it's not just the shock of it all. It's a completely new world of the way they talk, the what they're talking about. I didn't have a clue. And I just remember like day one or something, everything getting chucked to my bed, all your kit, you have to put it all in. And I just wanted to cry. Like They're like, right, in the morning, everything needs to be in the lockers, all in here. Everyone else is just getting on with it. They're all like mid-20s, I suppose. Um, I'm still a teenager and I was too scared to ask for help. Like I'm way out of my depth here. This is how bad it was. It's embarrassing. So then my first inspection the next morning, because I was rushing and so nervous, I even missed all my belt. I had my belt on and, and my corporal was like, first of all, he asked for your number. Like you have to say, you know, P06 3516 Echo, you know what I mean? Recruit level, la 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 I couldn't remember my number. So I looked out down at me and my, my belt was around my waist. With, it didn't even go through the loops, you know. And it's like, what are you doing? Like I was terrible. Like I was opposite to what you needed to be, you know. So yeah, I had a hard start. But they give you a chance, you know. And I started learning a little bit and getting better. But eventually what clicked is what I realised is actually I'm going to complete training because what I noticed is all of the pass stuff is physical. So like all the tests that you have to pass are physical. So if you fail something like your map reading or your or my admin, the only reason you wouldn't pass something is if you failed a physical test, you know, like the commando mm. tests, if you failed the bottom field test, if you don't make the times. And so I just got thrashed all the time. So I'd fail something like my admin or whatever and then just get thrashed, but I'm fit. So now I'm even getting fitter and fitter Mm. and fitter. Then I'll start getting confident because I'm thinking, well, actually, I'm going to be all right because tomorrow's the whatever test and I can smash that. So I'm not that bothered, you know. Uh, Well, I was bothered, but I knew I'd get there eventually. And then my corporal, he was an amazing, amazing person. Eventually, he kind of saw a bit of himself, I think, in me and really helped me. Um, move to that next level and then what I always say is like if you've got skill you, you start here and you can peter out but if you start here and eventually you get better you know you can go up and up yeah, and up the and that's kind rise. of yeah so once I started getting confident and learning it 
now I'm overtaking people even, yeah, you know. Self-esteem. So by the end of it, everything went really well. And um, I'll tell you a real quick funny story. I'm doing really shit. It's about week 15 now, and it's a big, important test um, week. And um, my corporal says to me, right, Mark, all I'm going to give you in charge for this exercise right in the field is a um, the headset for the radio. If you hand that back to me at the end of the exercise, do all the stuff, that's it. Just look after that, you know. And I was like, oh, yeah, cool, I can do that. I remember getting off century. We were on a century routine, and then... Um, sort of went to bed and then we got bumped all the training team come down and you have to get all your kit ready and get to the um, RV point so God, I'm trying to pack it all in get to the RV point anyway we have a kit inspection Corporal pulls me aside he says oh, Mark you got the headset the radio yeah 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 because I always kept it in the top of my berg and checking on it he said yeah I said yeah I got it yeah um, he said you sure so then straight away I think, but it ain't there <laughs> um, he, he pulls me over to the side and he, and, he, and he had it in his hand he said because they basically go and sweep the harbour position once they bump you to make sure you yeah. haven't left anything because you can't leave anything behind obviously especially at war and he said look we can do two things um, I can tell the troop boss about this and you'll probably get back trooped he said or we can use this as a turning point and a learning curve what I'm going to do you're going to lanyard that now to your neck and any time I say to you prove headpiece you're going to show it me make sure that's on you for the rest of training so obviously I couldn't wear it around my neck in training but I'd have it in my pocket you know and any time I ask for the, to see your headpiece I want you to have that as a reminder of this moment so I was like yeah I can do that and that and that stuck with me sometimes you just need someone to believe in you don't you yeah and then that was it from there I got better and better and it was real cool and then the end of training you do your final exercise and he used to look over at me and he'd be like Mark and I'd get it out of my thing, kiss it, put it back in, and then go and do a section attack or whatever. And I've still got that. I took that to Afghan. That's like my lucky charm. I'll take it to football with me. I think that's it's really good as well because somebody's noticed, but he's given you such a simple thing that you can attach to. And, that, yeah. and that's then wiring that part yeah. of your brain, well, it's isn't the it? Belief, it's yeah. the belief that actually I can do this, you know. And um, all, the, all that body hardening and obviously, you know, failing all your admin, and but building and coming from the general... Um, soldiering your mental fitness and the body hardening with that alpha male environment when you passed out mate you must have just felt invincible I did but you come crashing down really quick because I felt invincible well I completed training I was still 18 such a young lad yeah so I then went to fleet protection group Royal Marines and then it was like because you're up here when you pass training but mm. then you pass out and then you're back down here in mm. fact you're even worse <laughs> now you're in a, either a commando unit or you're with the big boys you know and you've got to then earn their respect again so it's like I had to start over again and it was just as hard as training um, because there's no one to protect you there back then as well it's all a bit more cuddly now but I went to fleet protection group and no one wants to be there because basically it's a, it's um you do like all UK security stuff. Everyone wants to be in a commander unit. You want to get yeah. out there and do stuff. So and everyone's got a bit of the ump being there anyway. So certainly the young lads or the new lads, they're the they're the fun. You know, I mean we we used to have a court every night. Um, so every night there'd be a court in 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 the troop. I used to have to roll the dice every night anyway for being new. There's a dice with 12 punishments. But then, of course, everyone else would always pick me up on stuff and be like, so like the senior Marine normally would stand up and be like, right, any misdemeanors of the day. And obviously, I'm the young boy. Everyone's like, yeah, Mark done this. I mean, ridiculous. But I can't say anything, you know. Does everyone feel that deserves a roll? Obviously, everyone's like, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so I'm, I'm rolling two or three times a night, you know. I'm like, and some of them might be row the channel on the tra- on the rowing machine, and then you might have to do, I don't know, 10,000 lines of something. Just stupid stuff, yeah. but just like... Oh, mate, and it was just, like, hard, you know. And again, like, I wanted to sit down and cry, but, again, it got so much better once I got through that, you know. It's just, it's just, it, all it is is to to say, right, are you tough enough to be respected in this thing? And you can go either way, you know. And it is hard, because I think before you're, if you're young, you can get out early, and I know a couple of lads got out and stuff, even after training, because it, it's not what it's all cracked up to be. So I think it has changed for the better, because it was tough, but it, it also made me who I was, you know. Mm. Um but again, the same thing happened. I met a sergeant then who really took a shine into me. And again, I just went up and up and up from there. Um, that was when my enjoyment come from it all again. You know, we were talking just before we came in and recording, we were talking about, you know, like having that sort of stress as a young man, weren't we? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, yeah, like as we evolve as a, as a group of people, and we realise actually, yeah, you know, we need to look after the well-being and the, and the mental health and all of those kind of things. But actually... It is good to have some sort of, you're, you were capable of doing it. Yeah, yeah, massive. And it gave you the confidence to know that you could do it. Yeah, and then the situations that you yeah. found yourself in the last well, 15 years. All the success that I've had in my life since, in business, 
if I take you to the sports field in football, you know, everything that I think is good in my life has come from hardening that mindset. Mm. Um, I felt when I left, I could do anything because I understood. I've never sort of gone into something with talent. You know, some people at barbering, they pick up a pair of them, they're really good. Yeah, you know, talent. Or they've got that sort of talent in anything. I've never had that. But I learned that I get excited because I think, all right, we'll see in two years. Or so, you know, we'll yeah, see yeah, in yeah, year yeah. three, year four, you know. Um, and I sort of grind it out and, and I love that journey from it. And that's from the, the marine side of things, I think. It just takes us back to the question of, you know, body hardening and combination of mental fitness, you yeah. know, despite it being in an alpha male environment. There's a lot of use in that, isn't there? Yeah, definitely. I think the only way you grow is you have to get uncomfortable, you know, through, through anything. If you want to get better at anything, you have to chuck yourself into uncomfortable situations. Like this today, like I was nervous and anxious coming here today because I haven't really done this. So I think I've, I've always wanted to do this sort of stuff because, like I say, I've got done a lot of hmm. probably interesting Some stuff. Some really cool stuff, to, yeah. man. <laughs> but I, I get very anxious because I've never had that. Um, I felt that people are questioning me, you know, like I get anxious about it all because I don't feel that it's enjoyable stuff. You're, here, you're here now. And the yeah, thing, exactly, and the thing yeah. is, I suppose the, the thing is, like, I'm not going to put myself in the same bracket as the sergeant and the corporal that, that took yeah, you under yeah. their wing. But the fact is, I see that in you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I see yeah. the benefit of you in the wider society yeah. from allowing you to sort of flourish in, in this setting. Yeah. And, and a bit, a bit of a big up for this podcast, actually, because I've been asked to go on things before and I haven't. Um, and the reason that I wanted to come and speak with you is because I started listening to your podcast and you're very good interview. You're very relaxed and kind of like a calming presence and open. You're, you're very, you're a good interviewer. So that's good. Thank <laughs> you, man. I don't even look at it like an interview, you know, because yeah, yeah. I think it's a, just a shared conversation. I yeah, think that's what, yeah, and that's what probably helps. I don't feel yeah. I'm on the, I'm on getting interviewed by a, a, yeah. my boss or something, you know. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. it's just like a chat. So it's all about thanks, mate, because it's nice that you pick, you pick up on that. But this is about you, um, a serious elite fighting force man. Afghanistan, as you passed out, obviously you've talked about the the UK force side of things. That's sort of like the secondary part of your training in a way. Yeah. Again, the mindset hardening part. When you found out you were going there, how did you feel? Well, super excited. When you were in the Royal Marines, they get your mindset ready for that because everywhere you look at Commander Training Centre Royal Marines is war stuff. And they harden that in you in training because they know if that happens, you need to want to do it, mm. you know? So everyone who completes training wants to go to war. So no, I was super excited. That, that Otherwise, don't join, you know? Like, that's exactly what you you, you should want to do. Um, and that's what I wanted to do. So no, I was, I was super excited. I asked to go, you know? If you joined, if you were unlucky enough to join maybe after the 80s to... to you might not have ever done it's like, anything. It's like sort of 2012 till now. Yeah, sort of and then, then, yeah exactly. So that you can, oh, I was a Royal Marine, but... You're still a Royal Marine, don't get me wrong, and that'll never come away from you, but you know what I mean? There's different periods and eras yeah, of, of it, and I was very lucky. I was in, in 2005 when everything was going off, you know, so mm. everything was about Afghan, and it was serious stuff, and it was exciting times for let's, a young soldier, you know? Yeah, let's get into it, mate. They're, they're, what about the day you left England, getting on that plane to landing, finding your digs? What you do, you don't fly into war, you fly into Bastion yeah. and Kandahar, which are like big air bases in the middle of the desert. Yeah. There's nothing going on, it's luxury really. Yeah. Like, um, <laughs> There's a lot of people that go to Afghan, there's only like infantry troops and commanders that are scrapping. If you were on one of these camps, they've got Pizza Hut, Starbucks, everything, they're, they're, they're yeah, luxury. Yeah, comfortable. Yeah, oh, comf lovely. You do six months there, it's just like our tanning holiday thing, it's not mm. that bad. But obviously then we have to go out and scrap. So when we got there, it wasn't that bad, I can't really remember. Our first convoy out, we had to do on a big vehicle convoy. Um, we stopped doing convoys because it got dangerous. You'd get blown up. And I had a driving license. I wanted to get my driving license. Before I went, they, they stitched me up a bit because they were like, right, you can do your driving license. I didn't have a license. I thought, like, brilliant. Yeah, that's great. Um, but obviously, they had a back in my mind, then I could drive some of the vehicles out there. So I had, a, I had a, one of the only people that had a, a license to drive was called a Vector. So it was a 52 vehicle convoy and I was driving the Vector, but shock, the Vector was the ambulance, um, also backed up as an ambulance, you know, and you hear all the horror stories that if you get blown up, they daisy chain it. So like someone who gets hit, you have to come in to collect the body. So then they'll put more IDs down basically around you. Anyway, so my first experience of leaving the camp after about two hours in, one of the vehicles got hit, went up and I just get on the, uh, the headset, get up to wherever now. <laughs> And in my mind, I'm just thinking, oh, I'm not going to get blown time. up now because it's fucking, I've got to go. And, um, but lucky, I, I mean, I didn't. And the lads were all right. I mean, they lost um, limb, fingers and stuff, but they were, they were fine. It weren't, they didn't die. 
but yeah, that was so that was my first initial sort of thing. For, yeah, that convoy. So you like your troop was part of a company, wasn't it? There's, yeah. I think there's three sections. Yeah. Yeah. To so a we were troop. Lima company, and then there's three troops in in the company. Yeah, I think seven troop, eight troop, and nine troop. And in your particular section, how many men in your section? Eight men. Eight men. And yeah. so. You, Obviously, you're a driver, but what was your duty? No, so I want to don't want to get that right. I was never a driver in the Royal Marines. That was I'd done that once. So that was that was only that first time. After that, we we used to then all the ops from there. We we'd fly in. When you go to um, in the Marines, you can go out um, and stay in FOBs, forward operating bases, and you basically just have to secure that area. So mm-hmm. you go on operate around that area. Um, they know you're there and they'll just IED the area and you don't go go out to scrap too much. They just wait until you get blown up. Mm. We were really lucky. We were strike operations. Normally only SF do that really, but our, our company got strike operations, which means you fly out, kill whatever, fly back. So after that convoy, we pretty much done strike operations, which is great because that's what we wanted to do. So we'd fly in. Ops would range from 24 hours to probably three weeks is the longest we'd be on the ground for. And then we'd fly back in, reservice our stuff, fly back out. Um, to another mission or whatever. Do you remember your, like your first patrol, like the smell in, in the air? No, that I remember. Go- um, the, the only way I can explain it is cutting hair. It's just like cutting hair for you because that's normal to you. Yeah. Yeah. So after a while, you can't stay heightened all the time because your body just won't stay like that. Mm. You know. So eventually, it just becomes normal. So you. So it's very quickly. It's, it's mad. I mean, I've I've been asleep in firefights because sometimes firefights might go on for three days. Mm. So as long as you've got your, uh, you'd have like your, your sentries out and everything, and they might be firing and rough rounds coming. But you know how close it is. Sometimes it's just free, it might just be sporadic fire from areas, and and you have to sleep. You know. So there'll be times, obviously not when you get kicking right off, but there'll be times where you you get your head down. Once I slept. Because you just sleep anyway. We normally would take a compound or this time we were in a um, school, um, an old school that they took over. And um, I found a mattress. I think like, that's a bonus because you can get to sleep on something. I slept on the mattress, went for a piss, come back, a trace around, come through the window and set the mattress on fire. So it's like, yeah, I was lucky that day. You but, cheated death just because you needed a piss, basically. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. But that's, mate, there's so many missed calls of, it's, it's, it's a, such a lottery of... Uh, um, like when your numbers up, though, like obviously it's just a lucky luck game, you know. Did you find like culturally not knowing who was your enemy because it was? I could give you a couple of crazy stories. So this is how bad they are, the Taliban. So they'd, they'd send a young lad in with a wheelbarrow and say walk towards that compound. So the guys on sentry weren't sure what to do because it's just some kid mm. telling him to stop, but they don't want to shoot a kid really. When they got close enough, it was a, a hand wired IED, you know, like so they could set it off. Yeah. When they got close enough, they just blew him up, blew it up, and, and killed a couple of the lads. You know, mm. that's how bad it is. And like the next day, for instance, locals come over because they want to take the bodies away. You know, but they fight just like a nine to five is a little bit. It's, it's so weird. Like so, in the first light, you normally get into a scrap. And then around lunchtime, it all dies down. They literally just stash their weapons and just go and be locals again because they know they know our they're very clever. They know our rules of engagement, so they know they haven't got a weapon. You can't just shoot them, even though you know the Taliban. So they'll put their weapons down and then just go in. And then about one o'clock, you start scrapping again, um, and then until they're finished for the night, you know. And then they'll go back into it's like a normal nine to five job for them, you know. It's real strange. Um, so yeah, it's tough, but. Um there was another story we, it weren't with us there but like um, they were playing um, football with the kids and stuff and because the lads were playing with the British they killed them you know they, they like, killed they, their own they killed the young kids you know because they saw them play football with the British soldiers and yeah. stuff um, but it's a brutal way they operate it's cruel isn't it war is a cruel thing you've done I presume you've done like a few months now like what what was your impression of that war in general mm. if we're talking about when I was there you don't really have an impression on it because, you, like I keep saying, it sounds weird, but it's just a job. Yeah, if I'm honest. You know, just got on with it. Just got on with it, and 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 um, there was good, really good times and really bad times. You know, um, tell us some of the good stuff. Just like funny things that I still remember, like like so everyone has a PR headset, and like so you're on like, but we might be yomping all night to go to a new objective. And um, we'd call it a drip net. So we'd, we'd switch the frequency over just to to like channel three. And then me and my mates would all be just be just talking and having a laugh and stuff. And then we have to quick switch back, make sure, you know what I mean? But I always have that in the back of my mind. We had such a, just little things make you laugh, even though that's just having a conversation and stuff. But it was just just funny. We'd always just be saying, God, this is shit. And then we're like, yeah, this is shit. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was weird. We were walking for miles and miles. And um, if you go through real hard times with someone, 
that's the connection that nothing can compare to that, you know, that connection that, like me and my best mate, he's a special forces now, he's SBS. I found a big weapon stash and we had to have be all round defence on it until the next morning so it can get blown up. And mate, this was December in Afghanistan, it gets freezing. And because we didn't think we were on the ground much, no one had, we didn't have sleeping bags. Luckily my mate had a bivy bag because it's just lighter, which goes over your sleeping bag, you know, and... um I remember that night, we had to just sleep in there together. Um, we, don't, we don't really sleep because you have to do a century routine, but that's the only way we survived the night, really. And that always sticks in my mind because it's just like, you make such a bond. You're that close to someone, you know? You're yeah, closer than you are with your missus, you know? Yeah, you're literally spooning, spooning each yeah. other to keep warm out in the middle of the open. It's quite a crazy, surreal thing, really. I think the weather and, and everything plays into it. Like, it's a mountainous region. If you took away the compounds, the war... There's a stock beauty about yeah, it, isn't there? Did you ever sort of relate oh, to that? Did you? I used to. I used to love. Sometimes we'd get and I'd look up and just take it all in the the, the place and look. I remember always used to look up at the stars and like, yeah, it's quite a weird happiness in. I got happiness from war, hmm. in some ways, and I'll tell you why that sounds crazy because life stops. So like, there's no other worries. Nothing else matters in the world other than where you are at the time, you know. So it's a, quite a weird thing, war, because you don't have a phone. It's just you and your friends, and that's it. So although there's really bad times, there's real good times as well, because you just have a great bond with people, and there's no distractions in life. You know, life's so busy in it all the time. Out there, it's not, you know, I mean, you've just got time and friends, really. What is crazy is the fact that you can have that reflection because you get those moments of being grounded, so present, just yeah, with yeah. your mates, looking yeah. at stars, the fun, the banter, yeah, 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 yeah. those the still little in things between. mean a lot, which yeah. we, we miss in real life I because think we do. because life's too quick. So you don't have them little moments of just sitting and. It seems like we're well, almost at a permanent war with social yeah, media oh, these days mate, and, and, and pressures and stresses yeah. and yeah, it, yeah, it, it drove me crazy when I left. Really. Hey there, it's Howie. Just interrupting really briefly. I've got a quick favour to ask. We don't run ads on the Pod Barber, but if you're finding this podcast helpful, or if you know someone who might benefit from listening to it, please take just 10 seconds to share this episode by tapping on those three little dots on your podcast player. From there, you can text or email the link to the show and spread the word of what we're trying to do here. That'd be great. Mick and I really appreciate your help. Okay, back to the show. It's great to hear the good stories, isn't it? Um, But your, your unit was mortally affected and, you know, that ambush... Christmas Eve, tell us about what happened, man. Yeah, so um, we lost quite a few guys, really. Um, but Ben obviously was in our troop. Um, he was in our company. But he was in seven, like I say, seven troop, eight troop, nine troop. So it was Christmas Eve, and this was Christmas Eve evening, and we got told Christmas Day we all get to get call our parents um, or loved ones, you know, or your missus or whatever on Christmas Day. And we thought we'd finish for the day, you know, on Christmas Eve. We thought, well, in the morning, it's Christmas. Mentally, we I think we switched off a little bit and we were, um, we were in a dangerous area. And, um, well, we got ambushed, really. They knew exactly what they were doing. I think they knew that we might have our guard down a little bit, you know. Um, so we, there, was, there was two compounds um, that we were, we were going to sleep in for the night and we just started taking big fire from everywhere, all three sides. And it was pretty intense. Um, uh, so, yeah, so Ben... Uh, you okay, man? Yeah. Uh, so, so Ben had a lasm, yeah, and no one wanted to carry the lasm because you, you only fire it once and it's gone, yeah. Um, so he wanted to fire it because once you fired it, you got rid of it. It was a rooftop, I was down to the floor. I was actually in the compound next door then, but we could see what was going on, you know. Um, so he's like, I'm going to fire the lasm. One of the lads, I didn't hear it, said, no, you can't. Because to fire the lasm, you can't fire it from the prone. When you're up on the rooftop getting an income in, you're prone, you're laying down, you know. But he wanted to get up, so he got up onto his knee to fire it. And as soon as he did, he got shot straight through the neck. They got him off the compound, brought him down to our compound. Um, Men, it was giving him CPR. We got on the net to the higher up saying, look, one of the lads has been shot, you've got to come, you know. Um, they wouldn't come and land because it was hot because we were taking so much fire. They've got a rule that if you're taking fire, you're in a red zone. They won't come and land because they, they say an aircraft's worth more than a, than, a, than a life, unfortunately. It's just the way it is. So they landed. We had to carry his body about 500 metres under fire so he could get airlifted out. But he died already. But war don't stop, you know. So, like... That was the first time that any of us lost someone close, you know. That was like a big reality shock to war because it was like before that, people got hit and stuff, but we ain't seen death, really, mm. like one of, from one of our own. That was the first time. 
but that, and that's the realities of war, I suppose. You know, that's the that's the bad times of it. You know, the, the people we, we take casualties, and you know what I mean. Lives lost. Um, oh, I'm so sorry for that as well because that particular event. I, I remember hearing it on the news. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As well because Chris Hogan, yeah, yeah. we talked about it. Yeah, I yeah, knew yeah. all you boys. I knew you were there. Yeah, yeah. We all sat there trying to sort of fathom that, and yeah, yeah. Um, I can I can't imagine how horrific it was to be there. I can't. Even for your mum and dad and everyone. I... My mum took Afghan harder than me. My mum still struggles from it now because she's such a soft um, warrior anyway. She had um, something that affected her heart slightly. Um, she has to take tablets, I think, for her heart speeds up, I think, where she got so anxious all the time. You know, she wouldn't celebrate Christmas while I was out there. We had Christmas when I come home. So, yeah, that, that's the other side of war. The people at home suffer probably more than the people out there. I still, this sounds crazy, I still wanted to be there. Yeah. So I'm happy with what I'm doing. And I can, from the people at home, they can't, they don't know what's going on. They don't want you to be there really probably and stuff. So it's quite a weird dynamic really because I still wanted to be there, you know. That was my, um, if I put my mind to say, I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it. And this sounds crazy. And I wouldn't really want my kids to hear this. But I was fully prepared to die. And I think I always... That's my mindset in life, you know, like I, I you know what I mean? I'm going to do that and that's it. You know, I already had that sacrifice, you know, in my mind, you know. Obviously, I don't want to die. No. <laughs> like, don't we go wrong, I love life. But in my mind, that, that's the sort of sacrifice you have to make. I can, I can give you another example of how extreme life and death is from Afghan. So now when you go through compounds, because it's not like you're fighting all the time. So you start to relax a little. You're not worried because you literally go, again, like cutting air. You're cutting air all day. You might go through compounds all day. So this was um, compound 50, I don't know. So it was a big thing. It was all in the paper. We weren't expecting nothing. We didn't have no intel. We knew the Taliban were around, but we didn't know we were in this compound. We go in. Griff's there. I'm, I'm second man. We turn into the door. We're about to go to the door. Round start hitting the door, the top of the door. I thought someone was in that first room. So I've kicked the door. As I've turned around, there's a guy, honestly, like, well, by the back end of the, like, 10 metres yeah, away meters. from me with a big PKM. Far as a PKM at us, but they're, they're terrible shots, so most of them are just, like, whatever. Um, and Pete, that big heavy machine gun, you know, it, fl- it went straight up and it started hitting the top of the door. We got down, we've gone around outside the compounds, a, a wall, five foot wall, you know. We know now there's people in the compound. Um, and we throw some grenades yeah, into man. the compound they threw grenades back over but they were sh- luckily there were shit old Russian grenades they didn't really make too much of a thing well, if they landed next year they would but other than that they weren't too bad we got on the net to the boss Taliban and he what did we do he said right pull back to our compound so we all went back to the compound said to the boss look we went in there's Taliban in there um, what do you want us to do he gets on the net to the higher boss and he's like well that's one of our compound we have to take the compound you know as part of our objective that's what you're there for at the end of the day so it, it wasn't as bad as it sounded because now we know there's it. So we've got all the defence up, all firing into the compound, already smashing it up. So there ain't too much fire coming back. We weren't sure what, what's happening. But So there's me, my team, they're like 18-year-olds, 21. Like We know we're going in now and there's a good chance that something could happen, you know. So it's the first time ever that I said to my, my best friend, Cotters, I said, look, if anything happens to me, tell my mum and I love them, you know. Um because you are prepared like then, you know. Um, but it was a big success. Everyone was listening in on the headsets because they all knew um, what was going on, you know. This was quite, quite a big thing. Yeah, we kicked down the doors, grenaded every room. There was three of them that were killed and none of us got hit. It was a real big success. And that was written up in the Sun newspaper. And now if you go to, well, you won't go there, but a 4-2 commando, um, I noticed last time I was there, they've got the PKM um, sort of mounted and that on the wall and the, the, the talk about the, uh, the that sort of attack because um, it was quite a sort of... Uh, normally in Afghan, when you're fighting, you hear people fighting, it's normally not... You have to get unlucky to get shot because it's normally... You don't go and kick down doors and fight that close unless you sort of... Maybe the SF will probably go and do that for certain targets. But normally it's like 200 metre fire. Once there's no fire coming back, then you go in, sweep the area, make sure everyone's sort of dead or whatever. You don't actually go and put yourself in that sort of direct threat. You normally have like, or if it's real, there's loads of them, you'd have aircraft smashing it all up. Yeah, call in, um, call yeah, in yeah, an yeah, airstrike yeah. and stuff like yeah, that yeah, on the yeah. coordinates. I want to thank you for sharing about Ben. Yeah, yeah. It's an emotional thing to just to hear it, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. and I think I, I I have a strong connection yeah, yeah, because yeah. of hoax, and there'll be loads of people that listen yeah, yeah, in yeah, on yeah. this, and and I know how hard it is for for you to talk about it. So I'm drying my eyes. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> 
And, you know, and it's tough for you to share that as well yeah, and yeah, relive yeah. that. How how do you process all of that, man? Uh, we understood that's the sacrifice that we're all there to, to mm. make, you know. I found it hard. I found it really hard at uh, the, the event, like Christmas Eve, I always find tough, yeah. you know. Um, because you kind of relive it in your in your mind, but then you have to learn to switch off from it. I found Hogan affected me more probably than Ben, for different reasons. You know, so I don't know. I, you just you just have to process it. Mm. It clearly has affected me. You know what I mean? Like mm. later on in my life, but I don't know. I don't know. I just get on with it really. We talked about that Christmas. You get an R and R, don't you? Every two yeah, yeah, or yeah. four months. How quick after that? Well, that was our last stop before we went home. So you, we didn't know that we didn't know that at the time, but we we thought we were going back out on the ground. And they actually said, "Well, actually, we don't actually quite need to." And then they, they sent us home um, for two weeks. What was that like coming back home after that? I can't really remember too much, to be honest. It was it was weird, you know. You just kind of black it out. Yeah, I think probably that's why I started finding alcohol um, a bit too much because um, I used to numb my brain a bit because I'm, I'm an overthinker anyway you know I think about things way too much my biggest strength is my biggest weakness so like I, I think I never switch off you know which is really good because I get a lot done but um, it's also very bad because I can never relax you know I'm always I can't just sit there and watch a film or watch, you know, listen to Netflix my mind's always working so I think yeah I think probably I drunk too much at times um, well, I, I know I did um, because I like to just numb my brain you know from it all yeah that's that was your switch off and, yeah. and obviously yeah, just a weird thing. How were they with like giving you any sort of therapy or any chats or was that encouraged or was it still the alpha male kind of attitude? I think it still was the alpha male attitude, and but it's got a lot better over the last sort of few years. It it certainly was, I think, when I was in. Um, because it was, you got to understand, this was completely new. No one's been out fighting like that. I guess the Falklands, but the Falklands was different. Hmm. You know what I mean? So it was new to every. So you can't put blame. Oh, there needs to be because they don't know how people are going to be too much. I mean, the support is there, but the problem is with the support, it's not. They haven't got the resources to go around constantly. The solutions aren't there, are they? You, you have to reach out, and the, and now if you do reach out, the support is definitely there. Um, but you have to reach out for it. How long did you end up serving? Six years as a Royal Marine, and then went on to um, do the private sector. Worked in four man security teams. Done that for three years. Uh, the, the maritime security, anti piracy work. Anti piracy work for three years as well. I'll tell you a funny story just before I get into that. Ben, how, again, how intelligence doesn't doesn't really factor of success in life is. Um, so w- when I left, I weren't sure exactly what I wanted to do. I knew I was going to go into the security, but I weren't sure how legit it was. Really, I weren't sure. So I needed a backup because I weren't sure. It just seemed so weird. Like, I never even went for an interview. It was all recommendation only. So you had to be recommended to get into the company. You had to be a Marine or Special Forces. But it was it was like they were telling me, right, you're going to go to Heathrow. The first time I ever went out there, we were taking a load of weapons out. We're civilians now. You can't take weapons out. But only a, apparently you have to be a certain figure. In So you, you, this was a guy called Lord Alexander. So the first time I ever was going to go out, he was like, right, you're going to meet this Lord Alexander. You're going to check in like loads of weapons on British Airways, fly it out to where we were going. I think, oh, mum, we fly out to um, and go from there. So it was all quite surreal. So I needed a backup. I'm digressing slowly. So I needed a backup. So I was thinking about joining the prison service as well because it was slightly like the military. But again, I had done it for the prison service. You have to do a test, uh, English maths and all that sort of thing. A real basic one again. I went, oh, yes, well, easy. Again, I failed it. Um, <laughs> failed the uh, English uh, thing for it. And why I used to fail the test is because I've never been told I'm dyslexic, but I think I am maybe dyslexic or slightly dyslexic. Like, when I read I get things muddled up and when I write so so that's what happened the test it wasn't so much that I can't ever do these tests but take longer to process things you know yeah. so being part of a boarding team what was it like? and how is it different to what you've done in the marines completely different in the respect that it's more dangerous if something happens because you can't call in nothing you're yeah. in a four-man team and that's you so if it kicks off there's four of you but not as risky as Afghan to be honest because it don't kick off that much there would be some firefights to happen. I never got into a big firefight doing the security. Um, and three of the lads got killed, but not actually out on the ships and stuff because it's just very dangerous being out in some of them countries, Africa and stuff. If you're a, a, a British man walking around in some areas, it's very dangerous, you know. Mm. Um, services or not services. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so so a couple of the lads lost their lives 
from being in the wrong place at the wrong time because some of the areas that we operated in were very um, sort of dangerous areas, you know, and and, and, and that's another sh- wake up call to life. There's dead people at the side of the road, you know, I mean, some places you know, that, that you'd go to mm. in Africa and that. But the, the job in itself was amazing, to be honest. I can't talk highly enough of the first two years of it. There was a dynamic shift in the security, and um, which I can go back to from the Marines. So like the young lads were the sought after lads, but the older lads so XR majors and stuff, they didn't have that current experience. So there's always a little bit of friction between us. A lot of the team leaders were us young lads, even though the older lads were, um, you know, so there was a, there was a bit of friction in that um, with the dynamics of the security. But no, just in general, it, it was brilliant to start with. But what happened is the company was obviously making so much money that um, it got brought out basically by a group of investors, nothing to do with the military, and they just changed it all and they didn't care about us, you know, like they were like... If you got off a ship, if there weren't another ship coming in within two days, they send you straight home. But you might have only done a five-day transit, so then you go home, and then you might have to wait three weeks to get back out, and you're only getting paid when you're on ship. And then they just took the money down because the threat level was going down because loads of other companies were starting up. Yeah, competition. Um, and then they said, well, we don't need, like, four commandos. We can just have three foreign nationals and one British forces. And, yeah, it just got worse and worse and worse. And um, I knew it was the, it was sort of ending, really. So you decided to hang up the weapons. Yeah, yeah. Looking back on your career, do you have any regrets? Yeah, massively in the Royal Marines because I loved being a Royal Marine. And looking back, because I was so young, I was a very good soldier, but I questioned my ability to lead. But I knew I would have been a very good leader. Basically, I got to the stage where I was I was ready to become a corporal. So I was an acting corporal. So I just had to do my junior command course. But again, like I talked about, because I always question my my education, my, mm. my intellect, I got scared of standing up. Because you have to be, uh, you know what I mean, standing up, giving the lectures, doing the map reading. I know I could do it, but I doubted myself too mm. much. And I think I left also because of that, because I was a bit scared to take the next step. And if I'm completely honest, that's why I think I had, I've had issues later on in my life, because I feel I think I would have excelled, you know. As, as a Marine and went through the, the, the ranks and, and loved that. I loved that lifestyle, you know. You wouldn't have been the only one that took early retirement from it because yeah, yeah. of the gold rush as well, yeah. you know. That was the other thing. You were like, young at the end of the oh, day. Oh, mate, yeah, we, we, you're, earning, you're earning peanuts, really. You don't go and join the military for, for money and you're getting um, asked 10 times your money to go and do the same job in the uh, security world. It's like, you know what I mean? Obviously, we talked about Chris Hogan or Hoax, yeah. as he was known. Marines servicemen, servicewomen getting out. What do you think is the biggest issue? So for me, I guess everyone's different. I know PTSD is definitely real and and people struggle, but I've probably struggled a little bit with PTSD, but I don't think my issues, and I don't think a lot of the issues is PTSD, but I think it's the identity change. You have to change when you leave, and that is very hard to do because you don't really want to, but you have to to get on in, I guess, a normal society. So when I left... And when people leave, everything's completely different. Because in the Marines, 90% of people are all roughly the same type of people. And then when you leave, everyone's so different. So you can get pulled in so many different ways. And and I, and I found it very hard. I identified as a Royal Marine. You know, I was very proud of that. And I had strong values of who I was. When I left, I wasn't sure where I was going. So I was doing a bit of everything and... And getting pulled in the area, and I, and I lost my identity. And then I was like, "Well, I can't go back in. I, did, I didn't want to go back in, but I didn't want to be out either because I didn't know who I was, you know. So you've got to learn what you want out of life again, and, and who you want to be. And, what and, your new and, mission? And, yeah, is. yeah, exactly. Otherwise, it's just a, it gets a bit of a mess, and that's what I think people that happens to people. So what we're talking about is Chris took his own life. He, he completed suicide a couple of years ago now. Yeah, and. You know, anyone that knew him, he was a proper soul of the party, but he was unable to adapt. He was unable yeah. to change, and he was so afflicted by war, wasn't he? he? Yeah, yeah. How did that passing and hearing about that, how did that affect you? That, that affected me more than Ben, because... It's like your brothers. Both, yeah, exactly. So, like, I didn't blame myself for it, but I know Hoag was a crazy one. He was, a, like you say, the life of soul of the party, very crazy, and, that, and, he, and he stayed at mine a couple of times. Um, when, when I left, there was a point where I was single for a little bit and um, he'd come and stay at my house and, um, you know what I mean, we pied hard and, um, and that. But he started going a bit over the top. I was going the same way as him, 
really, but not on that scale. So I couldn't help him because I know if anything, if I brought him in, I'd end up being like him as well, you know. And then obviously I heard he killed himself. And then it was like, yeah, I, I took that hard, like really hard. But I didn't let on how hard I took that, really. Um I'm a lot more open now. I can talk to people a lot more now. But that was probably the worst stage of my life. My mental health after that was bad. People around me didn't know. I kept it to myself, you know. So you were able to mask that. Tell us a bit more about that then. Yeah, so like at the time, um, I would drink and I got in a bit of a mess. Everything was real mad in my life because this is completely weird out of context. I, was, I, was, I, I played football. That was my release. My football was my release because at that 90 minutes, I never had to think about anything, mm. you know. So I was playing football. I went up through the levels in football. And again, I wasn't a very good football player or I, I'm not a great, but my, my mindset, I feel I, I sort of could do a good job for the team. So I was playing for um, Sime Town Rangers, which is like a, a good level. So I had pressure because I was trying to be the best I could be doing that, but then I was also drinking a lot and, and even hiding it. My mindset was messed up because of hoags. And I felt I was pressured from all angles, but I didn't want to tell anyone. Um, and then obviously your loved ones suffer the most um, because they're thinking, what the hell is wrong with this lad? So the first time I knew I, was, I needed to start changing, I went to the doctors because I was just ill. And I didn't know why I was ill. I was having pains in my stomach. And I guess it was like stress, anxiety, alcohol. The doctor said my glands were, he said, look, you need to stop whatever you're doing. I think I, I was going through business as well. I was opening more, more business. I was just looking for things to keep myself occupied and busy, mm. but not worrying about myself, you know. And my mind and mental health was real bad. Why I mentioned the football, I didn't want to just gloat that I went and played high football, yeah. is because that was the first time I spoke to roughly a stranger, and, and he really helped me. Uh, Erkan Oakley, Erx, he's, he's the assistant manager at Soham. And I had to call him because I had to say, look, mate, I can't play football for a bit. You know, They've just signed me, played a few games, done all right, because I didn't come training and out to the match. And I had to say, look, I can't, I'm having some time off. And he was like, why? And he, I think he knew there was something. Mate, he... he allowed me to talk and he was the first person that I ever spoke about any issues to and I think oh that, that helped you know and because it, it's just I felt easier talking to him than someone else I love ones and I was like that that really helped and they're a fantastic I'll give them a shout out so I'm telling they're a fantastic football club they spoke to the lads when I come back in with them they gave me time and he, and he was really they didn't know me you know I've only played with them for three weeks you know but they really understood and uh, helped me get through that six months a little bit and then that allowed me to then open up to other people a bit more and, and was sort of the path of me being proud and open about I, I knew that I didn't have to hide it anymore you know I can speak to people and I'm not going to get judged or like they're going to actually be proud that I spoke to them you know it's great to find someone to listen, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, yeah. You've gone into the world of barbering and is it six shops, Mr Barber's now? Uh, yeah, I'm opening my sixth in Fetford. It'll be open in November. So you've adapted, you've changed. Like, you know, we were talking about it's good for that little bit of a test of hardship. But you, I know you've taken a leap of sobriety now yeah, yeah, yeah. because you've taken control of yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's about getting on that journey and yeah. sort of enjoying the doing of it. You're yeah. a father. How yeah. amazing is it to actually not be yeah. hung over with yeah. your kids? Oh, so it's amazing. <laughs> and now my kids and my wife, that's all that matters really to me, you know? So like, you know, when you're thinking at the end of your life, when you, if it if, sounds real over the top, but if I'm laying there, all the other stuff doesn't matter. All I want is that my children are proud of me. You know, I want to be a good role model to them. And that's all that matters really. Like, my goal in life, I know this sounds cheesy, is I want my kids to say when they're older, I'm their role model, you know. That's that's all I want, you know. If he, if he says I look up to my dad, I'm happy. You know, I've completed life as far as I'm concerned, you know. That sounds awesome. I think the what I really love about that, Mark, is the fact that you're a man who has had proper hardship, but you've actually extracted the quality of it. You've been able to adapt They'll do their own things, they're their own people, but they're going to sit there and they're, what they're going to see is a man that can go through hardship, yeah. can face trauma, yeah. can go through grief and overcome it. That's yeah. the quality skill that you've really got, isn't yeah. it? And you've nailed it a bit there because that's what I think about now. I used to be ashamed of my past or certainly when I was going through bad times um, and stuff that I'm not proud of um, when I was in a bad mental state. But I'm proud of it now because I'm proud of the person I am now. You're very useful. Yeah. I'm the person I am because of the bad stuff as well. If you put yourself through the hardships, yeah, yeah. you would I wouldn't not be. have been. Yeah, and yeah. it's not that everyone can go to war. You know, like we said, yeah. even if you sign up, it's not like that. But we can all 
You've got to build your self-esteem. Yeah. When you're doing that, you're you're emitting that to yeah. your children. They, yeah. they're, so, they're, of course, they're proud. Yeah. And quickly on change, it's a hard thing to do. But if they do want to change, but they're scared because you get identified, don't you? So I know people that when they go out and it's oh yeah, he can down a pint in this or this, or he's the lad who's the fun, the party lad. But as you get older, you might not want to be the party lad or the guy that downs the pints. But they they, they identify themselves to that. So then they're scared to change to be a new from from the judgment of other people saying, oh, you're being fake or saying, you're, no, you're a party lad, you're a thing. But it's like, no, nah, you can reinvent yourself as many times as you want. Exactly. Like, and be happy. You know what I mean? I might, in 10 years, be a different person again, and that's completely fine, hmm. as long as I'm happy um, with who I am. I think know? that's a great point to make because there's so there's so... It's so valid because it seems so stupid, but I bet you there is a hundred percent of people oh, no. listening here now who've gone through that same thing. How many of them have actually pushed through the yeah. month two, month three, yeah, exactly. to month six? To just to give go, it a go and to see if they're happier the other I'll side drive of it. tonight. Yeah, I'll yeah. pick you up, and yeah, then yeah. you're. But also, the the knock on effect of that is that you're not going to stay up yeah. till two, three yeah. in the morning. Because why would you yeah. need to do yeah. that when you've got kids and business here? Well, that's why it took home. me so long to change, though, because I was always scared to. I always didn't want the other, you know what I mean? Because it's hard. Like everyone's drinking, and you're the one not. You feel like, oh no, I'm not. I'm not being funny or this or that. But um, eventually, people respect you a lot more for it. I, I find, and then they they appreciate you for your true. So I'll, every time I do anything now, I'm thinking, is it in line with my core values, what I believe in, who I am? And if it is, then that's fine. Whereas I was doing a lot of things drunk that didn't in line with what I wanted, and that was making my mental health worse because I'd wake up the next day thinking, well, that's not really me. And, and I know there's a lot of people because when you're having them, you, I sit around now when people have started to drink, they'll 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 reach over to me and be like, so why don't oh yeah I'd like, I'd really like to do that but I don't think I can like or yeah, I'd like to cut my drinking down but, so it must be on their mind they must be thinking mm. it but they don't want to go through it I think and I think a lot of the time is being judged by their their peer circle you know of, I think it's not even to put the blame on our members of society our cliques our groups our schoolmates I don't even think it's that I think yeah. it's so inherited I think it's yeah, yeah you're right there, there, there you're comes right. the point there is no blame it is literally yeah. it's We've been conditioned, so to uncondition from yeah. that, we have to focus on change. You cannot focus on anything if you've got substances that are messing with yeah. when you get to the point when yeah. you're not having fun anymore. Yeah. And that, that's the point, because I don't want to be this person who preaches everyone that's the limit I don't of sobriety. Because I don't think that is right. I think a lot of people can drink and even take some substances if they're making them happy. That's fine. Because when I started drinking or taking I was really happy. Like in my 20s in the Marines and stuff, I'd get pissed out of my hand and have a great time. We'd mm. wake up in the morning. Because if, if you wake up in the morning and um, you're laughing about the night and yeah. it's all brilliant, then that's great. You're having fun. But I used to wake up or black out and I knew it weren't fun. You know, like yeah. I, I would like that weren't fun anymore, you know, and it was getting dangerous because I didn't know it was getting more and more reckless. You know, I, was, I was scared to what where it could lead to, well, you especially be, with the you, Hogan thing and stuff like that, yeah. you know. I used to not want to even be out having fun. I used to then want to go and lock myself in a room and just go mad, you know, and just numb my mm. brain. So, yeah, if, if the fun's not there the next day, then maybe you should think about, oh, maybe we could tweak this a little bit or, or, or maybe we could look at changing a little bit. Um, what about the, the idea that, you know, you're talking about your self-inquiry, you've got a very busy mind. You know, we can do that negatively because we've, you know, we're not in a great mental space. But again, it's like reframe it and just think, well, actually, let's just ask myself a few more questions. Let's be a little bit more compassionate. Let's understand where I'm at and think I'm continuing on a pathway. You know, instead of waiting until you're 45 and you're retired from the Premiership football team, why not go out and manoeuvre into something more useful before? It's like people don't approach yeah, yeah. change it Early. far enough yeah, in yeah. front. It's it, yeah, yeah. You don't wait for it to come. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go and get it. Attack it. Yeah. You've got to chuck yourself out there and then you'll find it. But yeah, you, people don't, they work nine to five, go home and watch Netflix, wake up and do the same and then moan about the life. And it's like, well, it's not, nothing's going to get better really. You know, um, if you just do the same thing and expect it to be different. Well, you can also pick up on the fact that we're talking about being open and having the point where we start to share from our difficulties and our, you know, mental health issues. But don't mix that up either with you just continually the cycle of moaning but doing nothing about it because you there's only so much energy someone else can give you as well so you've got to start to sort of not just promote the want to help and support that person you've got to show them like you showed at each stage every single person you showed them that you were willing to adapt yeah 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 
um, yeah, and get yourself in the uncomfortable situations because then your mind, it strengthens your mind all the time, you know. You're, you're strengthening my mind even listening to you now because you're making me realise by listening to people like yourself, I think that strengthens actually some of the values and the, the credits that we need to give yeah. to ourselves and yeah. to, because there is a world out there that's very material focused, but we're talking about, you know, the internal us. The, yeah, yeah. It's a bit, you know, I'm not going to go all spiritual, yeah. but it is, it's about the you inside of your yeah. material body, isn't it? I think you can get really stressed now with with social media and things because that's why, to, for me to change, I had to distance myself from all that. So I was on like Instagram and Facebook and everything. And now I'm, I'm not against that because business wise, it's very good and, and, and if you're using it in the right way. But the problem I had was, so you say Instagram, you, you get caught up in a world of like um, the materialistic, like living this perfect life. Because I was even doing it, like I say, when my mental health was terrible and I was in a world of pain, but like for the outside, people must have seen me, you know what I mean? Oh, cool, yeah, Mark's looked like he's doing well for himself and that. But I was shot to bits, you know? But because I wanted to show everyone, oh yeah, this is cool, that's cool. Even if it weren't in line with myself. So like I say, you have to be true to your value. So I've never been really bothered about fashion and sort of fancy stuff. I'm, I'm sort of the opposite. But when I started earning a little bit more money, I guess, and stuff from my business, I think, well, I need the Gucci top or I need the cool car or something. Really, just so I could put it on the Instagram because I thought that's what society wanted, you know. I always thought, oh, well, I want a Rolex. So I bought myself a gold Rolex. But after two days, it didn't make me happy. But I'd done it, I guess, because that I wanted to look like I was successful. But yeah. success, that's nothing to do with success. Success is just if you're happy inside and you're living your true value. So I, I sold it and then bought another barbershop because I enjoy business, you know. So, like, I didn't need the Rolex for proof of for anything. Um, so I had to come off all that. And that was the other reason that I could find myself and become happy because now I've got no distractions. So everything I do now... Is because I want to do it, not because I want someone to think something of me, you know. So if I'm here talking to you, it's because I want to be mm. here talking to you. You know I want to be in this presence, you know, rather than doing it, oh, because then I can put it on my social media and stuff. I mean, obviously, we will put this on social because it might help people. Yeah. But I feel sometimes people do stuff just because of what other people's perception of them, but that might not be true to themselves. But at times I was getting more and more unhappy because it, I was just lost. It weren't me. I, I like to work hard, go to the gym and be with my family. And I'm sort of happy, you know. Do I you don't know need what? anything That's, else. That makes two of us. Now, you might sound hypocritical because I've got all these businesses. So let me quickly jump onto that. But I love business. But I don't love business just for money. I love challenging my brain and I love creating business with people. And I like sitting at the table having discussions of business. Mm. And I don't do it just for the the clout you know of it i genuinely enjoy sort of business stuff you know if if I, if I did it just for the clout i'd just do it all by myself you know but i don't i share them experiences with other people and work with partners and business you're not selfish yeah, uh, yeah. and and i think that's the key it's not a greed yeah, yeah. it's not a material yeah, yeah. you're because you'll never be happy from that <laughs> never no i think if you when you put the searchlight on and you really focus that beam on you you become a centrally focused individual that's looking after number one yeah, yeah. and then you can look yeah, after yeah. number two three four and yeah, five yeah. and six that i yeah, think yeah. that's the key you've yeah. got to look after yourself first yeah, and that's what you've done yeah, and that's yeah. the difference if you hadn't have made those choices mate yeah, yeah. we're not sitting there having this conversation yeah and then everyone else suffers and that was the biggest big wake up for me when i was bad my boy was like becoming probably two and I was so amazed with how much he was taking in mm. you know he could see everything from me and he would start being like me and I was thinking well I've got a responsibility here you know exactly um and and yeah that's the change you, you if you, you need to change yourself and then everyone around you gets the better version of you you know mm. you've heard the podcast so you know that I ask this uh, question sex drugs and rock and roll man yeah. Um, just roll with it they're all good <laughs> they're all <laughs> extremely good in moderation well not even in moderation as long as they're, as long as you're keeping it in a happy place you know like yeah they're all they're all fantastic parts of your life that you need but don't ever let it get to a bad place with it you know and that's a strange thing the stuff that makes you happy can also make you sad can't it I guess yeah fine lines man it's, yeah. it's a fine line isn't it um, dude how do we support and follow your businesses well I've got all, all the business accounts that are on Instagram just give it a shout out so all the Mr Barbers Berry, Sudbury Stone Market Fetford Dis um, and Linton Fitness is the gym I've got a, a gym in Linton Fitness so if you're ever around there we've got a um, good gym facility there with PTs and a massage therapist so yeah that's the main thing and I guess my personal account if everyone did want to message me and honestly I'd help anyone with anything I feel helping people helps me the only social really I use at the minute personally is Twitter so level 1664 
is my uh, Twitter account because that's short, sharp, and I like that. So if you ever want to DM me, you can on there. That's great, man. Thank you. Thanks for coming in today. Cool. You're a star. <laughs> and um, this has been a, an amazing chat. I, you know what I like? Honesty, openness, yeah. values out on display, man, yeah, yeah, yeah. From, a, from a royal yeah, and, uh, and a great barber. Great. On that note, my man, Cheers. peace, Thank love, you. power to your day. Cheers. The Pod Barber is a That Media and Design production with Mickey at the mic and Howie at the controls. If you've been affected by any of the topics in this show, you can find more helpful information on the episode's page at thepodbarber.com and search The Pod Barber on social and let's get connected. <laughs>